Hi, Dr. Bush and Dr. Snodgrass here. Today, we're going to continue on with our Hypospadias Mythbuster series. And she pulls up our presentation. I'll tell you, if you haven't watched before, that this is where we take a series of topics of statements that families are frequently told in their consultations with pediatric urologists about hypospadias, and we look at those to see if they're true or not. So here's the Hypospadia Specialty Center that's in Dallas, Texas, and all we do is care for anywhere from babies up to all adult ages. men who have hypospadias. So today our topic is this, that Parents are frequently told that distal repairs are successful 95% of the time. And, and it's exactly this phrase that parents tell us, well, the doctor said this is successful 95, ne never any other figure besides right. that. So we really wanted to hone in on the data to say, is this true or not? So this, this comes really from the very, very beginning. As soon as a newborn baby is born, either the doctor in the nursery or sometimes even the nurse that's there says, you know, something's not right down there, but don't worry, it's, it's a minor problem that your son has. And then you leave the hospital and your pediatrician does his or her initial exam and examines the penis and then tells you, don't worry about this, it's not a bad case. And I know a pediatric urologist who's great and they'll just take care of this for you. And then you go see the pediatric urologist and that person also typically says, oh, don't worry about it. It says a minor issue and surgery is successful 95% of the time. And so you, you go probably with this in have mind. this in mind, right. whether you want your boy circumcised or uncircumcised, when your son was born, you had an expectation for what you thought things should look like down there. And at least, you know, our impression is that when the newborn doctor and the pediatrician and the pediatric urologist say, oh, don't worry about it, it's going to be fine, that you think your son is going to end up looking like and some do, but some don't. And especially for those families whose son has suffered complications like this, this whole idea that, wait, you said 95% success. And while you realize that doesn't mean 100% success, the number seems so small that you can't imagine that it's going to be your son that has a problem. And yet these are, you've read on the internet about various problems and, and that's what they look like in real life when they happen. They can and they do happen. And even if everything looks you know, okay in terms of their urinary channel, some boys can end up like this where things don't look good otherwise in terms of their skin or how the glands is configured. So, you know, there's issues that can happen both from a urinary channel complication standpoint and from an aesthetic standpoint, all of which we think are very important. Yes, because you want your child to have a normal penis and the goal of surgery is to make a normal penis. So even if the urinary channel turns out okay, as it is in this boy right here, the appearance of the penis is not normal. So how often does this all happen? What, what really happens to a large group of kids who go in for distal hypospadias repair? And we should have that kind of information in the United States but we don't. And the only study that we know of, which has looked at it on a national scale, is this one from Holland, where they uh, link together results from their uh, key surgeons around the country doing hypospadia surgery. So these were all pediatric urologists, specialty trained at their specialty centers that, that patients are referred to within their system speci specifically for hypospadia repair. And so they plotted the, the, the symbols on the graph are the surgeons themselves and the complications that they had. So let's add a red bar right there. And everything above that bar is more than 5% complication. So it's not 95% success. And as you see, there's really only a couple of surgeons out of the whole country that achieved that result that many of you have been told to expect if your son has surgery. In fact, um, really, it was only 15% of all of the surgeons that they looked at 
And overall, the complication rate, and these are for first time distal hypospadias repairs. They're not more severe versions. They're not redo surgeries. This is kind of what people expect for a newborn born with this hypospadias. Their average complication rate was 20%. So one out of every five boys. And if you look at the graph, you see there's three people up there who are outstanding achievers in and creating complications in that 40% or more of the boys they operated on had a complication like we just showed on the slide. So this kind of information is very concerning. And we believe that if a study like this was done in the United States, that we would see very similar results. So how can this be? How can you have a range of complications that's anywhere from 3% up to almost 50%. And there's really several main reasons for that that we've tried to boil down to three. And one of them is that you've heard that hypospadias is a common birth defect, and that's true. But no birth defect is common in the usual sense of the term. So it's overall, there's not that many boys who are born with hypospadias. In fact, a pediatric urologist, according to data reported from the Board of Urology, is that most surgeons, the majority, are only at fixing about one a month on average. Yeah, if you know statistical terms, that's the median number. And that means that half the surgeons do less than one a month and half do more than one a month. And, and the median number was just once a month. And Think about that for a minute. I mean, hypospadias surgery is a highly technical, delicate operation. And we always say to folks, well, you know, if you needed your heart fixed, would you go to a heart surgeon that did that operation just once a month? Or if you needed a knee replacement, would you be confident that a surgeon that did that maybe once a month is going to get the best possible results? But I think. Even more importantly than that is that most surgeons don't know their own results. And so we're going to come back to that in a moment. So can surgeons achieve that 95% success? Well, of course, we already showed you that on the Dutch slide, that there were three surgeons in their country who did achieve that. And in our series, as you see here, we've published our results in distal repair several times, and you see our range has been from 92 to 96%, and so it averages 95%. So you can do it. That's right. And in fact, it's not just us, of course, besides the surgeons in the, in the Netherlands. Here's worldwide a, a compilation of studies that show that only about 5% of boys undergo reoperations. And that's in over 3,600 boys having primary, the first time distal hypospadias repairs. So there's lots of surgeons around the world who are able to achieve 95% success rate. And you see on this that the range of the outcome range from three to eight percent in terms of boys who had complications right and so if you you ask us and you don't have to ask us we will volunteer it that the standard expectation around the world at this time should be that a boy having distal hypospadias repair has a 90 percent or greater success rate and, and maybe that doesn't seem like a big change from 95%, but again, when you look at the information that we're showing, in fact, it's very difficult to consistently get 95% success. But I also wanna point out that when people publish their results, it's the surgeons who are pleased the with their results who are publishing it. <laughs> That's right. If you're a surgeon, particularly at an academic center who has 15% complications or 40% complications, you're probably not going to be advertising that fact by publishing it. In fact, that was a big part of the Dutch study was to be certain that all of those surgeons that had to participate were anonymous in there so that there couldn't be problems that came back to that. So when we talk about this 95% success rate, it clearly can be done but there's a lot of folks that are going to fall outside of that, we think, and just we like we true. saw. We know this is true because we've had 
trainees and we've had even some surgeons admit that they looked at their results and they weren't as good and so they didn't publish them. So there is bias in publications towards this idea of 95% success. But I should add that some of those folks who've come to us with problems, when we reviewed what they were doing, it was a technical oh, thing sure. during the surgery, and they've been able to improve their success rate. So it's doable. It's just you have to take the right steps. So that really brings us to this next slide of, okay, I've got a son with distal hypospadias, or if you're an adult man, I have distal hypospadias. How do I find one of these 95% or, or greater than 90% surgeons? So once again, we'll give you three questions that you can ask. And one of them is, well, just how often does the person that you're talking to fix what your son actually has? And that's a really key question, regardless of the extent of hypospadias. How often do they do this? And then when they say, well, I do it all the time and my success rate's 95% more or less, the very next question out of your mouth should be, are those your own results? And if they say, well, yeah, then you really should press a little bit more and just say, sorry for asking, but how do you know that? Because what some of them will then say, well, are you asking, have I actually sat down and looked through the charts and I'll know, but I know that I just never see a boy back with a fistula. So that's a person that you want to politely thank for their time and, and move on to another consultation. Because if you haven't actually tallied your results, you don't know your own results. For lots of different reasons. And that's been shown across all sorts of different surgical specialties. And I think that it's really surprising for many people. I know that, you know, when I went into medicine and, and started talking about this, all of my family was shocked that surgeons <laughs> have no idea what their results yeah, are. They I work mean, every day. The vast majority know. of surgeons for the vast majority of the types of surgeries that people do truly have never tallied their results for most things. So what they know is what other people report. And so they know that we report it and they think to themselves, well, I'm as good as they are and therefore my results are probably the same. And, and that's where these numbers then come from. Remember that the published numbers are from people who are getting the best results, people who don't get that results don't publish and people who don't even look at their results just assume that they're as good as everybody else. And I think maybe even worse than that is that there are zero accepted standards. So when you look at open heart surgery, it was such an issue that death rates would range from very low at some places to very high at other places that their society made national standards that they had to report their mortality rates. And man, did we see improvement in outcomes after that happened because the centers that weren't doing so hot, now it was public information. So they got better or they stopped doing them. And the same thing's been true with transplant surgery too. So mm -hmm. in our view, this should be something that's part of the standard review from the Board of Urology or from specialty societies or something that surgeons who do hypospadia surgery for distal repairs should show that they achieve results with success over 90% of the time. But again, we're just telling you that that does not exist. And therefore, unfortunately, the burden falls on the family to figure out whether the surgeon is really capable of getting these results. And let me just interject this. Oftentimes, many people go in and see the surgeon and they think, oh, he's just the nicest guy. I'll be, he'll do a great job. And, and we're just warning you that whether your personal feelings about how kind or thoughtful or nice or, you know, caring or empathetic the surgeon is, has nothing to do with what their outcomes are. And at the end of the day, you're not going to a surgeon to meet a new friend. You're going to a surgeon to fix your child's problem. So hopefully, I mean, we've really worked. I worked with the, the, the surgeons in the Netherlands to standardize what their outcomes are. What is a successful surgery? What is not a successful surgery? We're not there yet in the United States. We 
have seen it work in other countries. We think it's fully possible. And hopefully that's something that's on the horizon, but just know for right now, we're not quite there yet. And this is important because if you're a surgeon who doesn't know their results, but you think that you're in that 95% success rate, then and you're doing things a little bit differently, and somebody even says to you, that's not the way I was shown to do it. There's no incentive to change because you think, well, what I do is fine. So you have to know your own results to know if you need to change. And we've been told by countless surgeons who have heard us say this, okay, I finally went back and I looked at my numbers and oh my gosh, were you right? I had no idea that I had complications like that. But because of that, now I'm doing better. So another thing that is so important and, and really so simple is just show me. If you go to a reconstructive surgeon, they should be able to show you boys that look like your son before and boys that you know look like what they fix afterwards and hopefully it's something that looks normal. I mean, come on, as moms, we love the before and after pictures, whether it's like from home improvement stuff or plastic surgery, all sorts of things. There's just no reason that we shouldn't expect the same from other reconstructive surgeons. Yeah, but aren't they just gonna pull out something that's the best one they've got? If you don't like that, then probably that's not the surgeon that you wanna to go to. I, I mean, we've seen countless surgeons who whip those stitches through the skin that leave that ruffly looking collar around there. And, and I wouldn't be happy if that were my I'm child sorry. with those results. And so if that's what you see, that, that surgeon may think that's perfectly fine. And for some people that may be perfectly fine, probably not. but you can probably find somebody who will take a little bit different care and time to, to close the skin a little bit differently. So a picture is really worth a thousand words in that regard. So don't hesitate to ask your pediatric urologist to see some before and after pictures. And if the response is, well, you know, I don't have any of those. Well, then again, that's a good reason for you to just keep looking. And you can help make things improve because by asking these sorts of questions, what are your own results? What do your pictures look like? It really is hopefully gonna raise the bar for surgeons all over so that boys don't get hurt. So we started this out by saying, many parents are told that distal repairs are successful 95% of the time. Is this a myth or is it true? Well, Actually, we showed can that it be true. is true for the sometime. minority of the surgeons that are out there. So that, but that's important. Before we finish, that's important because those of you who have a boy with distal hypospadias, many of you really, really lose sleep over this decision. So an important thing to emphasize is that yes, there are many surgeons who can get those good results but not every surgeon does. And so unfortunately the burden of proof is really on you to seek them out. And so when it comes to do most surgeons have 95% success, we're gonna actually say that is a myth that, that we're gonna bust that. So hopefully this has been enlightening. We've got a true false, I think our first one in our series. That <laughs> it's is both. both. Um, <laughs> But we're glad that you joined us today. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us at info, I-N-F-O at hypospadius.com. Thanks so much. Are you happy with it? <laughs>